Uh, last fall, I had cataract surgery. Um, Suzanne, what's her name here, took me to the surgery center, brought me home. We had a very interesting trip on the way back because of the anesthesia. Uh, but I got this special lens. Anybody know about this? It not only corrects the cataract, it corrects your vision. So I now have 20, 20, I made glasses in 20, 20 in this eye, 20, 20, 20 in this eye. Incredible technology. It's expensive. For those of us on Medicare, Medicare covers the procedure, but you gotta pay for these lenses. And I said to the doctor, I said, this technology is incredible. I said, your eyes, your heart, your lungs, your prostate. I said, what did people do 100 years ago? And the doctor dealt with it. He said, 100 years ago, you'd be dead by now. So, so I'm thinking, okay, well, what else in my life as I get older is going to have to be corrected that science is going to take care of? We're lucky that we have this technology today. Um, outrageous fortune. Is that an interesting title for a sermon, do you think? Steve, Steve. Steve needed a title for the bulletin, so I just came up with that. Outrageous fortune, okay? Uh, I was reading an article about the submarine that went down to see the Titanic, the five people that died in that submarine. Two of them were billionaires. Two of the people that submarine were billionaires, and the son of one of the billionaires, who originally didn't want to go on the trip, but they talked him into it. A French scientist and the man who designed and built the submarine. And they had made this trip many times before, but apparently the extreme pressure, the depth that the Titanic is, was weakening the structure of the submarine. And it completely imploded, collapsed, killing all of them. Outrageous fortune. The space shuttle. Remember Krista McAuliffe, the teacher in space? Out of a thousand applicants, she won that spot. They spent two years promoting that mission. She's going to go to space, teach, 50 seconds into that launch. Outrageous fortune. The Trade Center, the World Trade Center. I was in New York in 1993 when they drove a van into the basement with explosives in the hopes of bringing the towers down. I still have a piece of glass from the World Trade Center from that bottom. But later on, with the planes, they succeeded in bringing down the towers. Outrageous fortune. Can you imagine when you went to work that day? You worked at the World Trade Center. And the next thing you know, you're fighting for your life. I was watching Johnny Carson the other night um, on MeTV. Anybody watch Johnny Carson on MeTV? The, the reruns, all those people are gone. They're all gone. I think, man, Johnny Carson. He had Christopher Reeve on. Anybody know what happened to Christopher Reeve? He was, he, he was in the Superman movie, okay? Uh, he was riding a horse, I think it's called Dressage, where they go around to the obstacles, and the horse balked at one of the obstacles, and he went off head first, off his horse, broke his spine, was paralyzed from the chest down. And I'm watching him on Johnny Carson, he's virile, and he's handsome, and he's successful. I'll never know, outrageous fortune. Have you know where that phrase comes from? Outrageous fortune. It's Shakespeare. It's from Hamlet. Okay, probably, if not uh, Shakespeare's best play, one of his best plays. Outrageous fortune. There's a lot of, a lot of interesting quotes from Hamlet. Um, Get thee to a nunnery, to be or not to be, which is the uh, outrageous fortune speech. Um, a method to his madness, something is rotten in Denmark. All those famous quotes come from Hamlet. Anybody know the story of Hamlet? You know, you know what happened in Hamlet? Anybody, anybody seen the show lately at all? No? Well, Hamlet's father is murdered by his uncle. His father's brother murders Hamlet's father, the king of Denmark, to take the throne and to steal his wife. And Hamlet is, the, the household, the castle household is suspicious because Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, remarries like a week after the death of her father, of Hamlet's father. 
She remarries his uncle. So there's a lot of red flags going on, especially for Hamlet. But the household kind of dismisses it. But, but Hamlet's bothered by this. And then later on, on the castle ramparts of Elsinore, he, he runs into his father's ghost. And his ghost, the ghost of his father tells him what his uncle has done and demands revenge. This is the outrageous fortune that, that Hamlet has to suffer. Um, so Hamlet feigns that he's kind of, to dis disguise his search for the truth, because he's not really convinced. He doesn't want to you know, do something to his uncle without being convinced that he didn't actually kill his father. So he feigns that he's a little crazy, and they just think that Hamlet is madly in love with Ophelia. Okay, Ophelia loves Hamlet. So when they get together, Hamlet, this is the uh, get me to a nunnery speech. This Hamlet is so conflicted about what has happened to his father. Polonius is Ophelia's father. And but mistakenly, Polonius is behind a curtain listening to the discussion between Ophelia and Hamlet because he wants to know what's in Hamlet's mind. This is the method to his madness speech. Okay, they don't, they suspect that Hamlet's on to something. So Polonius is hiding behind a curtain. Hamlet thinks it's Claudius, the king, and stabs him and kills him behind the curtain, okay? This, the result of this is that Laertes, who is uh, Polonius' son, demands revenge on, on Hamlet. And this is the scene where they send Hamlet to England to get him away from Denmark. And they, they, they send Hamlet with a note the king gives him a note to take to England to have him killed. Okay? Hamlet intercepts this note and changes it, and then what happens? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are killed instead of Hamlet. There are nine deaths in this play. Nine people die in this play, nine characters. The king is poisoned by Claudius. Ophelia drowns, apparently she kills herself because of uh, her father being killed by Hamlet and Hamlet's rejection of her. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern aren't killed. And the Aertes, at the end of the play, they have a duel. And the king dips the Aertes' sword in poison so that if he strikes Hamlet, he'll kill him. He also has a goblet with poison in it so that if Hamlet wins, He'll offer Hamlet the goblet, and he'll die from that poison. Well, things don't turn out quite that way in the duel. Laertes drops his sword, Hamlet picks it up, and hits Laertes with the poison sword. So now Laertes is going to die, okay? Hamlet's mother wants to celebrate Hamlet's victory and takes the goblet with the poison in it and drinks that mistakenly, because she doesn't know that Claudius has poisoned the goblet. Hamlet is wounded by Laertes with the poison sword. So at the end of the play, there's like five characters dead on the stage. And this is the scene where Hamlet is in Horatio's arms. And Horatio is so distraught by this carnage on the stage that he wants to kill himself. But Hamlet implores him to tell my story. The rest is silence. So we have all these characters laying on the stage, dead, wounded. In the Old Testament reading we heard this morning, Saul is killed in battle. Saul and David compete to rule Israel. And Saul has been, has been very bad to David. At one point, David wanted to kill Saul. So when Saul is, loses the battle and is found dead up along with his son, the people celebrate. Because now they know David can be the king of Israel. But David laments the death of Saul because he knows all the things that Saul has done for Israel. He kept the country together. He was a, he was a great warrior. And he mourns the loss of Saul and his heir, his son. Again, an outrageous fortune for David, just as the outrageous fortune for Hamlet. 
We all can suffer over this fortune. There's good fortune. There's bad fortune. There's no fortune. And there's outrageous fortune. We all have good fortune. 